So it's finally time for you to create your first or maybe next Dungeons and Dragons character. You've come to the right place. In this video, I will help you create your own D&D character, totally from scratch. To follow along in this step-by-step -step tutorial, you will need either the player's handbook or the free basic rules book, which can be downloaded for free here. You can of course find the link down below. You will also need a character sheet, which can be downloaded for free as well, and some dice, so that everyone will be able to follow along. I will create a character using the options available in the basic rules book. There are different methods of creating a character. Some simply design an efficient character and decide a backstory along the way based on their features, while others already have a concept or inspiration in mind and choose to adapt the traits to that idea they have in mind. When I was younger, I used to go by the first method. All I wanted was to be the best. Nowadays, the second method is easily my favorite. As a storyteller, creating a character is one of the most fun things to do. I need well thought out characters, flawed and real ones. Even though D&D is a game of fantasies, an interesting character was extremely wise, yet just as horrifyingly weak. It's much more fascinating than a character who's pretty much invincible. Yet it's all about how one plays the character. How you as a player can overcome your character's stupidity, or physical weakness for example. In my mind, this is a game of problem solving, as much as anything. Both methods are of course acceptable, just do whatever feels best for you. So, the character I will create is an elven wizard, whose mission in life is to reveal all the ancient truths of the world, or at least that's the basic concept I have in mind at this moment in time. As a spellcaster, my character would take just a bit longer to create, but that's just to show you all the steps of building a character. If your character isn't a spellcaster, like a wizard, sorcerer or cleric for example, well, that's good for you, you will be able to skip the last parts of the video. I will fill out the character sheet section by section, making it easier to follow along for you. So here's the full character sheet, consisting of three pages. You will actually only need these two pages, as the middle one only exists for things like narrative details, your backstory and stuff you discover along the way. It works like a little notebook. A character is defined by three things, class, race and background. A character's abilities are mainly drawn from the class, which is kind of a broad way of saying occupational class, while race and background only give you things such as bonus ability scores, traits, and other various features. One can thus say that class is the essence of your character. Every class consists of different so-called archetypes or subclasses, but when you get to choose your archetype, depends totally on the class. For the fighter class, it only becomes relevant at level 3, while a cleric has to decide his subclass, or correctly phrased divine domain, right at the beginning, at level 1. And a wizard, like the character I'm creating here, gets to decide his so-called arcane tradition at level 2. The archetype or arcane tradition a character chooses greatly influences a player's experience. A cleric in the life domain might be more of a healer, while a cleric of the war domain will be, well, a bit more aggressive and combat savvy. My elf wizard will not have to worry about choosing arcane tradition until he reaches level 2. A class table can be found in both the player's handbook and the basic rules book. Summarizing the features and abilities, we will take a look at it from time to time, when we need it. But wait a moment, what the hell is his name? I almost forgot about that. I usually like to find names with meaning to them, something that fits the character's cause. It might not be very elfish this name, but I think it fits perfectly. Emanon, what do you think? As someone devoted to the ultimate truth, I feel like it's perfect. Can you find out the mystery behind it? If you correctly find out, I will heart your comment, I promise. Well then, there are multiple races you can choose to play as. Some only have one set of traits and bonuses, while others have sub-races with altered and tailored bonuses and traits. Emanon is an elf, and as elves have sub-races, I need to choose what sub-race of elf he is. High elves know the basics of magic. Perfect. That works well with what Emanon is supposed to be. So a high elf he is. Emanon will get the common elven bonuses and features, as well as his exclusive subrace bonus. Now it's time to decide upon a background, which gives you a package of skills, tools and languages, and a starting sum of money. As a wizard, a background of a sage is recommended, and is probably most logical. As a sage, I need to decide a specialty for my character. This can be done by rolling a d8, or by simply choosing one yourself. I'm going to choose myself. Let's go with a researcher. Then we have to decide upon an alignment. 
for our character. Some people ignore this fully, as they simply feel it's useless or even difficult to implement into the gameplay. But personally, I love playing with alignments, and so do those I play with. It gives an extra edge to the character and adds an extra dynamic when it comes to roleplaying one's character. What the alignment does is give a hint of a character's attitude towards life. Why would someone want to see the world burn, for example? Obviously, because he's a chaotic evil. To fit my character concept, Emanon will be a true neutral. Now that all of that is done, let's move on to the next part. Be sure to have the player's handbook or the basic rules book close to you, as we will have to refer back to class, race and background. The next thing to do is to decide our character's ability scores. Ability scores determine how proficient someone is at different tasks and is a core element of the gaming experience. It basically affects the character's skills, fighting prowess, hit points, spell casting, among other things. I will introduce you to two methods of generating our scores. The first one is the traditional method, using dice. 4 d6 dice are rolled. The lowest number is discarded, while the three highest ones are added up into a total sum. This is repeated until you have 6 numbers. The numbers are then distributed to the abilities, according to your liking and what you have in mind for your character. If you want to be a fighter, it might be a good idea to place the highest number on an ability such as strength or dexterity while a wizard, such as my character, is better off with a high number on intelligence. The second method is great for beginners, and to make things a bit more fair. That method is known as the standard array, no dice are rolled at all. Instead, a set array of numbers are given to assign onto each ability. And just as in the first method, you need to be clever about how you distribute the scores. There are other methods of deciding your character's ability scores, but these are the most basic ones. I'm gonna use the standard array method for Emanon, but before I place out the scores, let's take a look at the racial and subracial bonuses. That way you can better see what areas you need to improve, as well as which ones you can sacrifice. As a high elf, I will get a bonus of plus 2 on dexterity and a plus 1 on intelligence. As a wizard, it is advised that my intelligence should be prioritized, while my constitution and dexterity should be relatively high too. This means that my final distribution should look something like this. Looks like Emanon will be weak as hell. Now that we have our ability scores, it's time to get our modifiers, which in fact are more important than the ability scores themselves, as they give us the bonuses and penalties during the gameplay. The modifiers can be found in the ability scores and modifiers table. The scores that represent average are 10 and 11 giving us a 0 modifier, so if any of your scores are 10 or 11, you write a 0 inside the circle, and everything below 10 results in a negative modifier, while everything above 11 will give you a positive modifier. By reading from the table, my character's modifiers will look like this. He looks quite balanced, and average to be honest, and he must have a pretty plain personality. A character of level 1 has a proficiency bonus of plus 2. Filling in the blanks on saving throws is simple, just transfer over the modifiers of each ability. If your strength modifier says minus 1, then your saving throw is minus 1 on strength. The same is done for the skills. Look at what ability is related to each skill, and transfer over the modifier of that ability into the skill. Dex stands for dexterity, whiz for wisdom, and so on. For every proficiency your character has in any certain saving throw or skill, you get to color in the circle and most importantly, add your proficiency bonus, which in this case is plus 2. The saving throw proficiency is derived from your class, and your skill proficiencies are taken from various sources, such as class, background, and on some occasions race. Your class gives you options for which skill you can choose to add your proficiency bonus to, but the background and race do not. Knowing this, it's better to start with race and background, then choose from the options that are left. Well, my high elf seems to get skill proficiency in perception from his race, and as a sage, he gets skill proficiency in arcana and history. So let's fill in those circles. Now we're ready to check what proficiencies he can choose from his class. He can choose two from either of these. Arcana, history, insight, investigation, medicine and religion. I can cross out arcana and history, as my background already provided me with those two. And from the remaining ones, I think I'll choose investigation and religion. and the saving throw proficiencies my wizard class provides me with are intelligence and wisdom, perfect for who I want my character to be. The next thing to do 
is to add the proficiency bonus to the saving throws and skills that we just decided for our character. And there we have it. Now we can take a look at our character's passive wisdom. You calculate it by adding the number on your perception skill to 10. This means that my character has a passive wisdom of 10 plus 4, which is 14. Underneath the passive wisdom is the box for other proficiencies in languages. They include languages, weapons, armor and tools, and come from a race, class and background. Elves speak common and elvish. And as a high elf, I can master another language of my choice, and yet two additional languages on top of that, because of my sage background. I will pick Dwarvish, Orc and let's go with Gnomish. And because Amanon is a high elf, he is proficient in these types of weapons. Longsword, Shortsword, Shortbow and Longbow. He does not get any other proficiencies from his background. But let's take a look at his class. The only additional proficiencies he gets from his class are in certain weapons. Like daggers, darts, slings, quarterstaffs and light crossbows. And that's about it. Let's jump over to features and traits, as it is a good time to take care of it now. You find and bring over your features and traits from your race, background and class. The features and traits my character gets to bring over are dark vision, fey ancestry and trance from his race and subrace, and researcher from his background. As a spellcaster I need to be on the lookout for things like ritual casting and spellcasting focus. So as a wizard I get to add ritual casting and arcane focus as a spellcasting focus. Remember that the rules are unique for every spellcaster. A cleric, for example, also has ritual casting, but his spellcasting focus is holy symbols. He also has to choose a divine domain. Finally, for my wizard, I need to note down arcane recovery. All right, time to fill in the equipment. This time, we only have to look in our background and class. Usually, there aren't that many options in the background, as a sage, this is what I get to bring over, including 10 gold pieces. The class, on the other hand, gives you options. You get to choose between option A and option B. This is what I'm going to choose for Emanon. A quarterstaff, an arcane focus, a scholar's pack and the obligatory spellbook. Then it's time to decide our character's armor class. Because my character possesses no armor, my armor class is calculated by simply adding the dexterity modifier to 10, giving me an armor class of 10 plus 2, equaling 12. If your character has armor, you simply check in the armor table. And if you also have a shield, just add 2 to your armor class. The initiative is the dexterity modifier. My character's initiative is thus plus 2. His speed is derived from his race. As an elf, Emanon can move 30 feet per turn, which is about 9 meters. Maximum hit points are taken from the class features. For a wizard, it says 6 plus your constitution modifier. Quick maths gives me 8. My guy seems pretty darn fragile. Some racial features can modify this number. Hill dwarfs, for example, get an additional hit point increase of 1. Temporary hit points can be ignored, as they only activate with certain spells and class features. The hit dice is also found on your class features. For a wizard, it's a 1d6. Alright, let's move on to the next section. Here you can write down what your weapons and spells can achieve. There are only 3 slots as you can see, but you can write down as many as you are armed with. This is just for convenience sake. My character does not have any weapons. But for demonstration sake, let's say that he wields a dagger, as that is what he's proficient in. Attacking takes place in 2 steps. First you attack to try and hit your opponent. Then you inflict the damage. So how do you get your attack bonus? You get it from your strength modifier which in my case is minus 1, but if you're proficient in that weapon, as my character is, you get to add the proficiency bonus too, which would give me an attack bonus of minus 1 plus 2, meaning plus 1. But here's the thing, if your weapon, whether a melee or throwing weapon, has the property of being a finesse weapon, you may use the dexterity modifier instead of the strength modifier. A dagger is one such weapon, so I will use my superior dexterity modifier instead. This will give me an attack bonus of 2 plus 2, meaning plus 4, and the damage he causes with his dagger is according to the weapons table, a 1d4. But don't forget to add your strength or dexterity modifier, depending on which one you used. In my case, it's a plus 2. Never add the proficiency bonus to the damage. For ranged weapons, you use the dexterity modifier, 
unless they're finesse weapons, giving you the option of using the strength modifier. Yes, with ranged weapons it's the other way around, pretty much. This section is also for your spells. Now, let's say that one of my wizard spells is the firebolt one. According to the spell information, I need to make a ranged spell attack against my target. So what attack bonus should I fill in here then? On the third page of the character sheet, there is something called spell attack bonus. It is that bonus which we have to transfer over here, when we've calculated it. So don't forget to do that when the time has come. My turned out to be 5. But remember, every spell is unique, so you need to read the instructions thoroughly. Some spells, for example, force the enemy to resist them by making a dexterity saving throw, instead of the caster having to make an attack roll. The next part is my favorite. It requires us to get deeper into our character's mind. What's his personality and his ideals? How does he bond and with whom? And what are his flaws? You can decide this all by yourself if you have a concept in mind, or totally leave it up to the dice gods, which honestly can be quite entertaining, adding another challenge to your role-playing experience. If you want to use dice to decide this section, head over to your background. Each background has its own personality traits, ideals, bonds and flaws. As I have a concept in mind, this is what I want my character to be like, a bit awkward in social situations, and as a neutral, I want him to be on the path of knowledge. I also want him to possess some ancient truths which he protects from the wrong people. And finally, because he is so knowledge thirsty, he is ready to sacrifice civilizations for the sake of solving ancient mysteries. The character concept I had in mind in the beginning is amazingly coming to life. This section does not give any special advantages, it's just a guide to how you should roleplay your character's personality. There is one little thing that I haven't addressed yet, and that is this little inspiration box over here right above your proficiency bonus. Some dungeon masters award their players with inspiration points when they've done something they like or roleplay their character well. These inspiration points can for example let you roll dice. It's very subjective though, which is why many groups decide to skip it fully. So here we are, if you've created a character who isn't a spellcaster, you're finished. Yes, I mean it. Completely finished. You can jump straight into the fires of D&D. But if you have a spellcasting character, like I do, we have a few more steps to complete. Be sure to have your third page of the character sheet ready. Emanon is a wizard, meaning that his spellcasting ability is intelligence. Clerics have wisdom as their spellcasting ability, for example, so check your class features carefully, as you can find that information under spellcasting. The spell save DC is the number opponents have to be to resist your spells. The number is calculated like this, 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your intelligence modifier. For a cleric, use the wisdom modifier instead of the intelligence modifier. As Emanon is a wizard, this is what I get, 8 plus 2 plus 3, this is 13. And the spell attack bonus is his proficiency bonus plus his intelligence modifier, a plus 5. The spell attack bonus is used when a spell requires the character to make an attack roll whether it's a melee or ranged attack. This is the case for the firebolt spell I showed earlier in the attack and spellcasting section. This is the bonus I was referring to, so go back and fill it in. How many spells a character can learn and prepare depends on the class. As my character is a wizard, I have to check in the wizard class. You do the same for your relevant class. Each class has its own spellcasting table. We begin by checking the spellcasting under the class features. At level 1, I have a spellbook containing 6 first level wizard spells of my choice. I can prepare as many spells as my intelligence modifier plus my wizard level, meaning the total of 4. Fill in 4 circles at level 1 and choose your spells from the spells list. Then take a look in the spellcasting table under your class to find out how many spell slots your character has. My wizard has 2 level 1 spell slots. This means that despite having 4 options, he can cast level 1 spells only twice a day. That is until he has had a long rest and replenished his spell slot. But we can't forget about the cantrips. These are level 0 spells, meaning that they're so easy and familiar to the character that he or she can cast them unlimitedly, pretty much. They aren't as powerful as level 1 spells and cannot be changed once they've been chosen, so pick your ones carefully. Take a look under spellcasting for your class. My wizard knows 3 cantrips, but because I'm a high elf, I get to learn an additional cantrip. So don't forget to check your race and subrace features. And the second page of the character sheet? Well, you can fill it in by yourself. 
Everything there is pretty much self-explanatory. As I said earlier, it's kind of like a personal notebook. As a wizard, I can write down my 6 level 1 wizard spells there, so that I remember which ones I have chosen, for example. We're finished! By following these steps, you have now created your own character. It might not have given you full explanations to what everything is, that would have taken the length of another video to do, but I believe it has covered everything you need to know to be able to create a character from scratch on your own. All one simply needs can be found in the player's handbook, or the basic rules book. And don't be afraid of making mistakes, even I do them sometimes. Checking with your dungeon master can be a great idea, if you feel uncertain about something. I hope this video has helped you. If it has, or if you enjoyed what I had to share with you, please give it a like. And if you know someone who needs help with creating their character, make sure to share this video with them. If you are interested in more role-playing and storytelling content, subscribe and hit that notification bell to be the first one to know when a new video is out. I'd greatly appreciate that. Thanks for your time and patience.